Good evening and welcome to tonight's Senate Candidate Forum held by the Lakeville Area Chamber of Commerce. To begin, let me introduce myself. My name is Jim Kretsch. I'm the owner and one of the attorneys at Kretsch Law Office here in town. I'm a Lakeville resident and the current chair of the Lakeville Area Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Board of Directors. I, I did my best. This is the first time I've worn a suit uh, since February mm -hmm. and I tried to pick a tie that <laughs> Didn't get, I, I didn't want to be accused of any kind of party affiliation, so I got a black and <clears throat> gold tie on tonight. I am not a uh, Saints fan nor a uh, Vegas Golden Knights fan, but I did my best. Um, tonight, I'm going to serve as your moderator. The timekeeper tonight um, is Rebecca Gunderson, and Rebecca's sitting to my left, and she's with Farm Bureau Wealth Management and is a fantastic chamber ambassador. Uh, we have invited all six Senate candidates to join us tonight. Uh, unfortunately, Lindsay Port will uh, be an, unable to be here, but instead we'll have a representative read a statement. Uh, as this is a forum and not a debate, uh, its purpose is to allow those in attendance and listening at home to get to know each of you <clears throat> and what your positions are regarding business issues. Therefore, we've organized the candidates in attendance by random draw, which took place with the candidates prior uh, to the start of this evening's event. Um, we're gonna start everything off with uh, Mr. Hall to our left, but as I mentioned, Senate District 56 candidate Lindsay Port cannot be here with us tonight, so she has sent a representative to read a two minute statement on her behalf. This is a statement from Lindsay Port. Thank you to the Lakeville Chamber of Commerce and to all of you who are watching. I would be there with you if I could have attended virtually during this pandemic. I'm a mom of two young children in the Lakeville public school system, the founder and executive director of a nonprofit. Our family owns a small business in Burnsville and I'm running to be your senator. I've grown increasingly frustrated over the last decade watching small businesses in our community struggle while seniors share their fears about property tax costs and rising prescription drugs prices, and our schools make cuts every year. Since our current state senator was unwilling to address these issues after holding office for a decade, it was time to step up and fight alongside my neighbors for the policies we deserve. I have a decade of experience organizing and working with voters in our district, and my background of running small businesses while raising a family is a common story for many in our community. In this moment of tremendous uncertainty, we need leaders here at home that are willing to listen to our entire community and take our voices to St. Paul to fight for the policies that help our families. For too long, anti-business politicians like Dan Hall have foisted responsibility for providing health care onto the backs of small businesses instead of recognizing every person deserves high quality, affordable health care. Small businesses need an option to buy into Minnesota Care and a statewide program for paid family leave so that providing needed benefits to employees doesn't bankrupt our businesses. Our schools need to be fully funded at the state level so we don't have to continue to raise property taxes to fill the gaps the state doesn't cover. We must prioritize rebuilding our local economy during this pandemic by investing in small businesses. And we must understand that safety is a product of healthy and invested in community. It is not something that we can be imposed through use of force. I'm prepared and ready to take on the tough tasks and fight for policies that our community deserves. Learn more at lindsayportmn.com. Thank you all. Excellent use of one minute, 59 seconds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in keeping with the current uh, COVID-19 protocol, the tonight's format is gonna be a little bit different. All candidates are spaced six feet apart and will be wearing masks until it is their turn uh, to speak. Candidates were sent a list of potential questions in advance with the understanding uh, that we would also take audience questions. Uh, the audience uh, behind me as well as the audience at home. Uh, for those members who are in person tonight, the question cards are located just inside the council chamber uh, behind me. Uh, please write your questions down and uh, give them to the Chamber President, Krista Jack. Krista, raise your hand. 
Uh, for those uh, listening live, you may email your questions to Krista at lakevillechamberscvb.org. That's Krista, K-R-I-S-T-A, at lakevillechamberscvb.org. Personal questions uh, or questions directed to one candidate will not be accepted and will not be read. Uh, and time will obviously dictate uh, how many questions we get to tonight and how many we pose to the candidates. Finally, each of you will receive two minutes for introductions and opening remarks, two minutes to respond to each question, and 90 seconds for wrap-up and closing remarks. Um, for those playing along at home, the candidates participated, as I mentioned, in a random number draw before tonight's event uh, to determine the order in which each will speak. First up this evening is Mr. Dan Hall, and thereafter we will proceed clockwise uh, uh, across the dais with each of you taking uh, the next first question or the um, uh, closing remarks as we progress through the evening. Uh, with 30 seconds remaining, our timekeeper will hold up this sign. And when your time is up, she will hold up this sign. And with each new question, we will start with the newest or the next candidate uh, clockwise. Are there any questions? All right, I'm looking forward to this job interview, gentlemen. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. With that, let's begin with Mr. Hall. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to the chamber uh, for putting this on and for uh, the audience for being here. Uh, I, I'm a little sad that uh, Lindsay is a no-show, but uh, she has her reasons, I'm sure. Uh, it's been an honor to represent Burnsville, Savage, and Lakeville for the last 10 years. Uh, I've lived in the community for 29 years, though I grew up in Minneapolis, uh, went to Roosevelt High School and on to Augsburg College, where I was their first All-American hockey player with my older brother, Corky Hall. My wife and I, uh, Valerie, and I have been married 46 years now and have eight children and 14 grandchildren. Of my eight children, two are lawyers, one's a hairstylist, one's a homemaker, one's a physician's assistant, one works at a local university, one is finishing up her master's degree in occupational therapy, one just graduated from the U of M. All are married except for the last one. My first job was as a dishwasher for the Veterans Hospital, the old Veterans Hospital in South Minneapolis. But most of my time there ended up being that I would feed uh, vets coming back from Vietnam because of the trauma they experienced. They couldn't feed themselves. I've coached hockey, volleyball, soccer, and softball, as you can imagine, with my eight kids. I've been a camp director, a swimming instructor, a church pastor, a fast food manager, a YMCA director, a teacher, a principal, and I've worked 19 years for the Burnsville Police Department as a chaplain. During my time in the Senate, I was on Judiciary Committee, Education, Transportation, Veterans, Environment, Natural Resources, and I am currently the chair of local government. Let me conclude by saying, serving my constituents at the Senate for 10 years and being in the majority and the minority has given me a unique perspective. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jose Jimenez. I'm the Senate candidate for SD57, which represents Ab Apple Valley, Lakeville, Rosemont, and Coates. Uh, I've lived in the district for 21 years and married to my lovely bride, Sandra Jimenez, who's also running for state rep on the 57B side. I think we need to find another hobby. Uh, we have four kids and two grandkids. Uh, we're members of the Eagle Brook Church in, in Lakeville, and we're founders of the Jimenez Law Firm, a small patent firm in, in Rosemont. I grew up in the barrios of Chicago, a racially mixed neighborhood in which my parents owned a small laundromat. I was the son of an immigrant steelworker, and my mother was a seamstress. My parents always said that education is the way out and was the key to success. So I worked hard, and I went to Northwestern University, where I received my degree in electrical engineering. And then I went to John Marshall Law School, where I received my degree in Juris Doctorate. I later ret returned to Northwestern University to get my MBA. The reason I'm running is twofold. One, to preserve the American dream for others, and two, I want to fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. I've been blessed to live the American dream. I've been a law partner in two Twin City law firms. I've been a chief patent counsel at a medical device company. 
I've been president of the Hispanic Bar Association, and an active member of the Hispanic MBAs and Hispanic engineers as well. On the business side, I was a general manager in Central America. I was also the sales director in Mexico and a quality director for a $1 billion computer division in Pennsylvania. Secondly, I have fought for others through my pro bono work. I was a volunteer lawyer at Línea Legal Latina, where I represented poor Hispanic clients on a pro bono basis because of my ability to speak Spanish fluently. I fought for another client in small claims court against DHS and won, but that made me realize that DHS really needs reforming. President Kennedy once said, let us not seek the rep Republican answer nor the Democratic answer, but the right answer. Let us not seek to fix the blame for the past. Let us accept our responsibility for the future. Friends, we have a lot of work to do to bring us all together, and God's help, with God's help, we will do that. Thank you. Well, good evening. I'm Greg Clausen, a member of the Minnesota Senate, and I'm seeking re-election. I would like to thank the Lakeville Chamber for establishing this forum to share with the community our candidates' backgrounds, our qualifications, and position on issues. I've been an educator for over 40 years. The majority of my service has been in the Rosemont Apple Valley Egan Public Schools as a teacher, coach, assistant principal at Apple Valley High School, Rosemont High School principal, and as a district office administrator. Given my background, much of my work in the Senate has focused on education. I have been a member of the E-12 and higher education committees, authoring the all-day kindergarten bill and several higher education bills to address workforce needs and the burdening costs of obtaining a higher education degree. Beyond education, I have a broad legislative background, serving on the Health and Human Services, Veterans Affairs, local government, and state agencies committees, authoring several bills in these areas. I have also been selected by my peers to leadership positions as a member of the School Trust Lands and Data Practices Commissions, Vice Chair and Minority Lead on the Higher Education Workforce Development Committee, Co-Chair of the Healthcare Workforce Commission, Appointee to the University of Minnesota Regent Candidate Advisory Council, and Governor Appointee to the Results First Advisory Committee. I'm sometimes asked, why are you seeking re-election? Well, beyond my commitment to public service, my wife, Bobby, and I have six grandchildren. And we just spent our 50th anniversary as a couple this past summer. I share a common value with all Minnesotans of providing a good life for our children and grandchildren for today and a better life for them tomorrow. Thank you. Well, good evening. I first want to start by thanking the chamber for hosting this forum and certainly want to thank you, Mr. Crutch, for taking your time to moderate. Uh, it's not always an easy job. My name is Matt Little. I'm your state senator and I used to be the mayor of Lakeville. I met my wife Coco in law school and uh, we got married at the Lakeville Arts Center. Uh, we also live in Lakeville uh, with our three dogs and our daughter Poppy, who is 14 months old now. I know there's a bunch of parents in this room and a bunch of parents watching, um, so I, I think you'll know what I'm talking about, but uh, do you remember that first time that your baby falls asleep on your shoulder? I'll never forget that. Uh, I'll never forget that moment. Because in that moment when Poppy fell asleep on my shoulder, I, I told myself, I gotta quit politics. This is way better than politics. <laughs> but in that very same moment, it occurred to me that politics is more important than ever. Because look at what is happening around us. Look at how we are treating each other. I mean, just look at the campaign they are running against us. There has been an endless supply of ads claiming that I support defunding or dismantling the police. That is false. That's absurd. I've supported law enforcement my entire career. I do not support defunding or dismantling the police. This district expects and deserves better than lies. And that's why I'm proud that our campaign is committed to the clean campaign contract. There's three parts. The first is I won't say anything false or misleading about my opponent. I won't let anybody on my campaign say anything false or misleading. And I've asked my party and I've called on any PAC supporting me to adhere to those same principles. And if they violate it and they send something false or misleading about Zach, I will be the first to denounce it. Because that's how important it is to me. And it's important because the way we run our campaigns is a reflection of how we'll govern. And I choose to campaign with the truth and with integrity. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Zach Duckworth. I'm the Republican candidate for State Senate District 58, which encompasses Farmington, Lakeville, and much of Southern Dakota County. Thank you to our hosts and all who have been supportive and encouraging during this endeavor. My family, volunteers, neighbors, complete strangers, it absolutely means more than you know. Also, an enormous thank you to my wife, Carly, for her remarkable patience and understanding. I'd like to say hello to my kids, Grace and Logan, who might be watching if they haven't already become too bored. Uh, it's hard to compete with PJ Masks and Paw Patrol. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to say a special thank you to our Lakeville Area Schools community. Today was the second day of an unconventional and unprecedented school year. In many cases, students excitedly returned to classrooms, others embraced online learning, Teachers and staff welcomed them warmly, and parents did their best to stay positive and flexible. It's been humbling to see our community and others across the state exercise a great deal of patience, grace, and understanding for the sake of our kids. It hasn't been easy. I'm not saying it's perfect, and many challenges lay ahead, but I'm confident we will find a way through it together. I'm a graduate of Lakeville Schools. In fact, it's where I met my wife. After high school, we both attended the University of St. Thomas and St. Paul. And when it came to starting a family, we couldn't think of a better place to raise our kids than in the community that helped raise us. At the age of 17, I joined the Minnesota Army National Guard as an infantryman and have been serving for over 15 years, including a deployment overseas. I'm a volunteer firefighter in my hometown and, have also, and have also have the privilege of serving as chair of the school board. In fact, I just came from one of our meetings. Additionally, I'm a small business owner. Living a life of service is all I've ever known, and I'm hoping to put my leadership, judgment, and experience to good use on behalf of our district and state. Thank you. Thank each of you for staying within the two-minute time limit. It's greatly appreciated. We have um, kind of a challenge ahead of us, all of the other forums. Um, three previous ones have all ended on time. So that's, uh, that's our benchmark. Challenge <laughs> <I> accepted. <laughs> I appreciate the effort so far. Um, I was remiss earlier. I should let you know that if uh, by chance um, uh, we get a little long-winded and, and uh, go over our two minutes, uh, I may step up to the podium. So if you see me get up, um, hopefully you, you can um, shorten up your, your last sentence. Uh, our first question tonight, I will pull out of the hat, and we will start with Mr. Jimenez. This is going to be a question about small business growth. And the question is, is what would be your, and this will be a question for all of you to answer, what would be your primary legislative goal related to small business growth and development? Being a small business owner and having started our business about a year and a half ago, Medical insurance by far has been the most challenged. I, I went, I, I went, we, my wife and I were actually terrified because we went almost six months where I was not insured just because I had a pre existing condition. And we had to just uh, wing it and, and then hope that the following year, this January, we were able to get covered. And that is something that many, many business owners are facing today. We've got to continue to find opportunities to solve that issue. Uh, ways to lower the cost so that we can invite more insurance companies to jump in and offer those opportunities. I think one of the things that we've done in the past has been reinsurance. That allows uh, the, the state to, to contribute to some of the costs that, that uh, lead to some of these high costs that sort of scare these insurance companies away from wanting to do some of these things. So if we can continue to renew that program, which looks like it might expire in this next, uh, uh, this next legislature, uh, that would help keep those players in. We noticed a lot of, a lot of companies jumped in and then were able to uh, offer those uh, at least lower premiums. Obviously with HSA and being able to push up the deductibles, we're able to make that happen. So anything we can do to uh, lower those costs, uh, get rid of the sick tax, sick tax, which brought on $1.2 billion additional costs, uh, to be able to then lower the cost to everybody else would be an opportunity to do that. So it would be one of my priorities. Thank you. Okay. Well, I will continue uh, to work with businesses in our area uh -huh. using the Department of um, Employment Economic Development programs and grant opportunities that the state has available. My major goal will continue to be in the area of workforce development. 
Retaining Minnesota's high school graduates for our workforce is a top priority. Minnesota is one of 13 states that has a net out-migration of high school graduates attending out-of-state educational institutions. We have a net loss of between 7,500 and 8,000 students annually to other states. These are some of our brightest students, and when I was a high school principal, we would honor our top students, our top 10 students, and every year, half or more would be leaving the state for education, and the problem is we never know if they really come back to us. This is a real drain on the talent that we have in Minnesota. The Office of Higher Education is currently conducting studies to determine how many of these students return to Minnesota. If you look at population data on a bar graph, the largest group of Minnesotans leaving this state are not retirees. The largest group is between the ages of 18 and 24. That's our future workforce. I have offered a bill, Minnesota Goes to College, to keep Minnesota graduates in Minnesota. I'll continue to support expanding the need-based Minnesota grant program to middle-class families in an effort to retain students, but also I support a merit-based Minnesota state scholarship program to keep talented Minnesota students in Minnesota. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. I want to start with some small businesses that are often forgotten uh, at these forums, and that's uh, the farming community. Some of these are the smallest businesses we have out there. Uh, they're family run, um, and they're just uh, uh, too often forgotten at the Capitol. Um, we need to continue with programs that we've been doing at the Capitol to get uh, youth into farming so that these family farms can live on. Uh, we also need some tax reform. Uh, for farmers, not only in property taxes, but in uh, some sales tax areas. One of the bills I've offered um, is to get rid of the sales tax on any grain bins uh, that are being built. And that's uh, a significant advantage when uh, we're in a time that storage of grain so you can get the best price is the way you're going to survive. Uh, more broadly, I think we need to make some big changes in Minnesota. Um, first and foremost, on health insurance. Um, as we heard from another candidate, I was one, the only Democrat in 2017 to support reinsurance, which is a program that buys down the premiums on the individual market. And then uh, two years later, I was only one of three Democrats to support uh, reinsurance. I think that's important for our small business community. But again, we need to, we need to allow people to buy into the Minnesota Care health plans. Um, it's it's uh, typically the health plans that people go to when they can't afford health care. Um, but this plan would allow people to buy in. And it makes sense because taxpayers are already paying for it. The premiums are about 28% uh, cheaper, and it's revenue neutral. So as we face this budget deficit that's upcoming, um, it's, a, it's a critical program uh, to allow people to buy uh, cheaper insurance. Uh, finally, uh, you know I mentioned that we just recently had uh, a baby in my opening remarks, and we were fortunate enough to be able to spend three months uh, with Poppy. And I think every parent should get that. I th and I also think if uh, a parent or child gets sick, you should be able to uh, take care of them uh, and build a relationship with them uh, without uh, going bankrupt. And so I think Minnesota needs some form of paid family medical leave. Thank you. Uh, well, first off, I'd start by listening to and putting myself in the shoes of our small business owners, employees, and everyday Minnesotans who are trying to earn a living and provide for their families. The anxiety, frustration, and uncertainty are real. Uh, as a small business owner myself, I understand this firsthand. I live it and see it every day. Uh, like many businesses, we've implemented safety measures and precautions. We have PPE. We enforce social distancing. We've embraced a flexible work environment and continue to compensate our people as well as work with them uh, because some of them have kids at home at times during the day due to their school situations. Like businesses all across Minnesota, we're doing our part. If afforded freedom and flexibility, the remarkable resilience and ingenuity of our communities would allow businesses to put their employees back to work and serve their communities safely. State, city, and county grants are helpful, but they're not sustainable substitutes for allowing a business and its employees to operate in a way that would ensure they're still going to be here for years to come. So my primary legislative goal would be working to find a way that addresses the state's deficit without overtaxing Minnesotans and small businesses. When managing my business, just like when you manage your household, when the funds are running low, you've got two options. You can cut wasteful spending, 
or you can reduce expenses, or oftentimes it's a combination of both. Uh, let me be very clear in saying that now is not the time to raise taxes on Minnesotans, their families, or businesses. So in terms of legislative priorities, it's uh, looking at the enormous issue that's going to be facing us. It's already facing us, which is a growing deficit. And if we don't use good fiscal conservative policies to address that deficit, we're going to be in trouble. Thank you. So the best way I can see to help our businesses is to open up Minnesota safely. If we did that, things would start changing overnight. Now the problem we have is a lurking $5 billion budget deficit that uh, is going to be really hard to cut taxes. But as a Republican, we have done this before. In uh, 2011, we had a $5 billion or close to that budget deficit. And believe it or not, if you reduce tax, the tax burden on businesses, you can actually increase the tax collection. Because reducing the burden means there's, they can hire more employees, and they can produce more product, and they can bring in more taxes. So there's a lot of things we can do. I, I like the thought on uh, health insurance and trying to lower that too. I had a bill that uh, I tried to get passed and it would uh, not allow anything used to be taxed. So whether it's clothing, whether it's cars, no matter what, if it's used, how many times is the government gonna take money from something that we sell? And who would that help? That would help a lot of the lower income people. So uh, I, I do my best, I'll continue to do my best with that, uh, but we need to do something, and the best thing we can do right now is to safely reopen our state. So question number two tonight, and I believe we're on to Mr. Clausen as the starting candidate. This is going to be a question about Lakeville business community. And there's an issue, side note, the, uh, I was reading on a web form today the use of the word the with proper nouns, and it just dawned on me, should it be the Lakeville business community or Lakeville business community? Mm -hmm. Side note, my apologies. Uh, what would you do to advocate for the Lakeville business community to combat the adverse effects on businesses due to the COVID-19 shutdown and general over-regulation? Okay. Mr. Claus. Thank you. Well, there's no question that businesses are in a very difficult uh, period right now. Uh, we've all seen uh, the headlines. We've all experienced, I think, on a personal level, changes that are occurring due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think when we look at this uh, issue, we need to have two goals. We have to have an immediate action plan for what to do now, and then we need a long-term policies to address this issue because it's not going to end in one day. It's going to be over a period of time. I think one of the key issues right now is our bonding bill that's uh, waiting to be passed, hopefully, uh, in the legislature that would serve as an economic stimulus for the state, put a lot of people to work, and put a lot of money back into the economy. But let's uh, be real here. This is a national pandemic emergency. It requires a national response. The Federal Government Cares Act has several programs to assist small businesses. We've got the Paycheck uh, Protection Plan, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, Small Business Administration Express Bridge Loans, Small Business Administration Debt Relief Program. So we have lots of programs out there, and I think it's important that we continue to advocate for these programs. We need those federal dollars. It's crucial as Minnesota will be facing a predicted 4.5 to $5 billion deficit as we enter the 2021 session. The Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development is providing interest-free emergency loans ranging from $2,500 to $35,000 to Minnesota-based businesses in need. Delaying tax payments or implementing tax installment payments, rent relief, zero interest loans with deferred repayment for six months or more, prohibiting late payment fees, suspending evictions, foreclosures, suspending utility shutoffs are options to be considered. 
To the second part of the question regarding regulation, I believe we need to listen to Lakeville and other business owners who are in the best position to identify over-regulation concerns to establish short and long-term pandemic assistance provisions. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, this is a great question, and I'm going to return to it shortly. I want to talk about the budget deficit because it's been brought up by a few candidates. Um, we're going to have to make cuts in the future. We're going to have to make cuts uh, uh, across a number of uh, departments. That's going to have to happen. Uh, and in this race for Senate District 58, the only person that has cut a budget is me. The only person that has cut taxes is me. Uh, I, I did it right here with uh, Councilmember LeBeau, who's sitting in the audience. We cut spending and we cut taxes. Um, and I think that's important to know when you have candidates saying they're going to do something but haven't done it yet. Um, in terms of the question, as soon as the shutdown started, uh, our office was working around the clock, uh, trying to figure out people's essential status, getting them PPP loan resources, navigating unemployment, um, and passing the loans and grants that have already been talked about. Um, but most importantly, my goal was to get people back to work safely. And the best example of that was uh, landscaping or lawn maintenance, right? Uh, in the first executive order, that was closed down for some reason. Um, and it made no sense to me because that is a job that is done with complete social distance. Um, and so we were able to uh, get on the phone with the governor's staff and colleagues, and we were able to get them back open quickly. And I think we continue to uh, try and find those ways. Um, I'm also a shameless promoter of our local businesses online, um, and I've been trying to uh, get, uh, inspire people to go and uh, spend their time and money uh, at our local businesses, whether it's breakfast at the Buckboard, everybody knows I eat there, uh, fish tacos at Barley and Vine, uh, or buying growlers at Angry Inch. Uh, voting or helping them with our time and money is something we can do now and in the future. Um, looking forward, what we really need is to provide predictability to businesses, and that means using a metrics-based approach um, to ending the emergency powers and ending um, the closures and, and, and COVID regulations on businesses. I think we should use hospitalizations as a metric, so if we fall below a number of certain hospitalizations, we can open back up and end the closures. Uh, so I have an MBA, I'm kind of a nerd, so I can say this with a straight face. Let's talk about budgets, okay? Uh, as a small business owner, and I think I speak for many small business owners throughout the state right now, my God, have they been managing budgets to include myself. In the midst of a pandemic, a shutdown, constant changes to say that small business owners don't know a thing about managing budgets, I think is a little disingenuous. Uh, in, in addition to that, working with the school district, to have to address the budgetary curveballs that have been thrown our way starting as, as uh, early as this year uh, has been a massive undertaking, and I compliment the district in doing that, and as a school board mem member, I'm proud to have done my part as well. So let me be very clear on this issue because it's so serious. I would advocate and fight for uh, their freedom to run and operate their business. I would go beyond just advocating for it, and I would actually vote for it too. It isn't just enough to sympathize with our business community. We have to have their back in both words and action. I've seen the pain in their eyes, heard the frustration and anxiety in their voices. When I visit them on Main Street and tell them they have my full support, it doesn't end there. I plan to actually follow through with it at the state capitol as well. Whether it's our Lakeville, Farmington, Denison, or Meesville business owners, they have the desire and wherewithal to operate their businesses and serve their customers safely. It's time we let them and all businesses across the state do just that. I don't want to focus on helping them just merely survive. We need to help them thrive. Too many great businesses have announced they're never opening their doors again, which means no more paychecks for their employees. We're talking about our friends and neighbors and their ability to earn a living and provide for their families. We need to stop putting obstacles in their way. Government needs to spend less time focusing on what we can't do and more time focusing on how we can meet this challenge without being overly fearful of it. When I say that I'll support and fight for our small businesses at the Capitol, you can count on me to follow through with that promise. No excuses because business owners don't have the luxury of offering excuses to their employees and customers. So this is going to sound a little bit like uh, Sunday school, where the correct answer is always Jesus. <laughs> uh, helping our Lakeville business community, again, first thing, is to open up our businesses, letting the freedom of this country move forward 
and letting them make a decision whether they want to be open or not and how we uh, do business. It's what I'm doing. Uh, I have voted four times to relieve the governor of his executive powers because we're no longer in an emergency. An emergency is needed when you need to make a split-second decision. Is that what's happening now? I don't see it that way. I see the decisions calculated, and sometimes they look pretty political, and I have a hard time watching that. The governor needs to give up that uh, power that he's kept. We have flattened the curve. We have plenty of ICU beds. And again, I vote that way because we have three branches of government for a reason, and we need to get back to making the decisions together. Well, I support uh, my colleague from the standpoint of really, I think we have to start from the premise of opening the economy. I I'm flabbergasted by the lack of the partnership between uh, you know, the, the, our governor and our business community. We're not children. We, we, we need to sit down and talk about how we manage a real estate brokerage agency, how we manage a salon agency, how we manage an athletic center, how we manage a restaurant. And because our business owners also care about their employees and their customers, they're gonna find a way to do it, the best way to keep everybody safe. But it really does come down ultimately, folks, to personal responsibility. If you do not feel comfortable going out Stay home. Have your friends and family deliver food to you. Okay, we do that every day. We've done it every year whenever we've had a flu or a bad cold. We don't bring that to work. We stay home. So, but we don't want to impose our, our concerns on others because in America, we allow ourselves to make our own choices and we don't ask our government to make those choices for others. And that's been where we've also been inconsistent. We're letting essential businesses like alcohol and the big box stores open while we're driving the small businesses uh, into ruin. They're looking for a hand up, not a hand out. The solutions of giving a loan is not a long-term solution. My parents had a f business for many, many years. So we want the opportunity to grow. When I walked in the Monk community in, in the University Avenue, it reminded me of what I went through in 1968 in Chicago with the riots in our, in our family and the public safety issues. We've got to work together. It's not Daddy, Daddy Governor Waltz. It's us working together as a team and trusting each other as Minnesotans. Thank you. So our third question is going to be a question about a hospitality and tourism. And this one starts with you, uh, Mr. Little. COVID-19 has devastated the hospitality and tourism industry. The industry continues to bear a large burden as capacity uh, restrictions remain for restaurants and events. Hospitality and tourism attract families, athletic tournaments, weddings, meetings, and more, all of which generate revenue and income in our community. What would you do to advocate for these businesses? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Crutch. Uh, we'll continue our budget conversation, then I'll return to that uh, uh, question as well. Um, I don't have an MBA, but I can do some basic math. And um, Zach, I'm not saying you can't cut a budget. I'm just saying you've had two years to do so, and you haven't. Um, so I think it's important, like you said in your speech, that our actions match our words. Um, the reason why you can't specifically end emergency powers right now with no plan, which is what the four votes would do, is because that would put a lot of people in a bad situation. Um, the first is there would be no workplace protections. So if someone was an at-risk person, um, that if they get COVID, they would likely die, they would have to return to work without any protections uh, whatsoever. And so they're likely not gonna be able to return to work, they're gonna be fired, and that's gonna put them worse off. That's why we need a metrics-based approach um, so that we can have some sort of path out of this that's based on uh, reduced hospitalizations. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that the minute the emergency powers are ended, if we don't do a phased out plan, there will be mass evictions, and that'll be a problem we have to solve. None of that if that would happen, would help a small business, large or otherwise. Um, so that ties directly in um, to this question. 
Um, in terms of hospitality, hospitality industry, I think we need to return to some sort of horizon for these businesses that they can see when we're going to be done with the closures, when we're going to be done with the regulations. Uh, the benefit of using hospitalizations as a metric to end the powers is it provides a common goal for all of us to defeat this virus and get our businesses back up and running. But if you simply ended the powers today as uh, some sort of ceremonial political vote, which they've been, you're going to hurt more people and you're going to hurt more businesses because we're going to have to do the shutdowns all over again. That's not the route. Um, so I'll touch on, since emergency powers have come up, I'll touch on that, and then I'm going to transition back to the question. So the initial bipartisan approach for responding to the pandemic, I believe, is, is what our state needed. Uh, we were faced with many unknowns and had limited knowledge. I give credit to both Democrats and Republicans for working together to protect, to protect the health of Minnesotans and our loved ones. Uh, collaboration and buy-in from both parties during times of crisis is critical to a unified response in the best interest of our citizens. The response has since evolved into a more unilateral approach, uh, which has heightened political divisiveness. Uh, we can't afford to be divided as we face the challenges before us. It's time to bring legislators back into the fold so that they can be a part of the solutions moving forward and so that they have the abil ability to represent their constituents. We need to come together at the Capitol and display leadership that encourages Minnesotans to come together across our state. Uh, so as we look at uh, emergency powers and what the threshold is for it, uh, I agree with Senator Hall uh, and, and Jose to the, the, the extent that maybe we've, we've gone beyond uh, the time in which they were, they were needed. Uh, I respect Matt's opinion on whether or not the legislature is there uh, in terms of coming up with a plan to move forward, but I think we have to give them the ability to actually formulate that plan and put it into action. Uh, we're not even sure what they're capable of, of doing yet, and it's essentially their job to, to represent us and find a way forward. As far as uh, businesses here and, and tourism in Lakeville and the district in general, it's a return to allowing uh, event centers, hotels, businesses in general, uh, allowing them the, the ability to manage and operate their businesses safely. There's no business owner out there that doesn't want to do just that. They want to safely provide the service to their customer, allow events to take place, which, oh, by the way, is the fuel of our local economy. Right now, we're trying to have our communities move forward without raising revenue to provide for families and for services that we need at a local level. Thank you. So I am uh, really grieved by what's happening to our outstate and hospitality. There are some counties out there that have had like two cases of COVID-19, and yet they're treated like they're in Minneapolis where all the businesses have to shut down. This is what we're talking about when we say uh, it feels like it's political, and, and it's just uh, irresponsible, as far as I'm concerned, to um, make rules that go general to the whole state and mandate these kind of shutdowns at least do like schools we're doing now, where every school can help make those decisions. We give some guidelines. Uh, or let's have the counties make, make those decisions. The statewide mandates uh, did not take into account some of the most rural areas. Uh, we should have, again, regional solutions. Unintended consequences can be lessened if we have more eyes. So again, if we open up the state, uh, the legislature can help make some of those decisions, not just a few people. And maybe we can stop some of those unintended consequences because we are killing the tourist system right now. Uh, thank you, Dan. I, I appreciate your comments. I think one of the things when this first came out, I said, we, why aren't we looking at this on a county by county approach? Most of the cases were in Hennepin, Ramsey, and Dakota, not northern, not greater Minnesota. There were some there but those had been treated dif differently in the situation. Secondly, I'll ask my colleague Matt to, to just correct me. Uh, I think I understood Matt to say that, it, that if Governor Wallace's emergency powers are taken away, then everything gets opened up. No, that what I'm saying is there's 201 legislators that can help step in and provide 201 different solutions instead of going from one person to the University of Minnesota and looking at a math model and saying, I think this is how we need to work the dials in order to do this. More minds, more collaboration is going to come up with a better solution on the long run, not just simply 
Like we're irresponsible, just gonna open things up. Thirdly, we have to deal with some of the liability issues. Got it. When some of these organizations start to open up, maybe we can come in as a state and say, okay, in, in the first year or two, we'll come up with some way of li uh, uh, limiting liability in case there's uh, concerns with lawsuits or something like that. Working with corporations to see if we can give uh, employees flexibility so that they don't feel like they're gonna get fired if they don't feel comfortable going in the work right away. So I think putting all our minds together, we can be intelligent about this, but it shouldn't be up to just one man, one party to just decide what the rest of us are gonna do. That's not how we Americans work. Well, as the question identifies, the hospitality in industry has suffered a severe setback. There's no question about that. But I think we really need to open when we believe the state has reached a safe metric level. And I think that needs to be based on science. It needs to be based on the medical community's recommendations. Unfortunately, this issue has become political. It's become political at the federal level and at the state level as well. I think uh, some of the colleagues here this evening have talked about regional opening. How did this pandemic get to the US? It travels with people and people travel. They move, that's how it spread. So I, I think that we need to be cognitive of that and make sure that we're doing a good job uh, in letting people know that they really have the solution. The American public really plays the major role in reopening the hospitality industry by complying with proven scientific behaviors to combat the pandemic. Wearing masks, social distancing, not participating in large gatherings of people will speed the recovery. I'll give you a personal story. I went to my barber after about four months of not getting a haircut here recently. Mm -hmm. It took him a long time to cut my hair. We had a long conversation. He tends to be on the opposite end of the political spectrum as I am. And he was complaining over and over and over how he's lost business. The people at the Augustana nursing home aren't coming in to get haircuts and on and on. As I'm paying him, he said, I was out in Spearfish for the big motorcycle rally. And I'm going, you didn't tell me that and you're cutting my hair? And I said to him, the best thing you can do to open up your barbershop and get more people here is to comply with common sense practices, like wearing a mask, social distancing, not going to a motorcycle rally where I think 25,000 cases were then spread out across the United States. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Duckworth, we're gonna start with you this round. And the question for you and the rest of the uh, candidates is, uh, this is gonna be a business retention question. What changes would you make to attract and retain businesses and improve the overall business climate in Minnesota? So as a business owner, I can tell you what I look for in a healthy business climate. Uh, does it make business and financial sense? Am I confident regarding the safety of my business and employees? Will local infrastructure support its operation and growth? And does the area have good schools and high quality of living? For it to make financial sense, a business in Minnesota can't be subject to overregulation or an unproportionately high tax burden. Business owners need to know that reasonable efforts will be made to protect their workers and property. Proposals regarding defunding police departments don't instill confidence. We need to be clear and unapologetic about our strong support for local law enforcement. I'm very proud to be endorsed by the Minnesota Peace and Police, Officer, uh, Police Officers Association. The state needs to adequately invest in our roads, bridges, and other aspects of our infrastructure in order to provide for safe and efficient commerce. And lastly, and this one is important to me, we need to support great schools and high quality education. Fantastic schools remain one of our biggest attractors for small businesses, their employees, and families. That coupled with a high quality of living, living draw folks to our district and encourage them to stay, which gets to the point about retention. 
So as far as changes go, uh, avoid overregulation and taxation, provide quality public safety, invest in infrastructure, and prioritize great schools. Thank you. So to improve our business climate, um, the first thing, we do have some of the highest taxes in the country. And if we want to improve things, we need to lower that. And frankly, the budget proposed in 2019 by our governor uh, and the House, Democrats, uh, wanted to increase our taxes at that point by $4 billion. That's with a revenue surplus. I don't know what they would do now. But that would turn us into a cold California. And I don't think many people would want to be here. It certainly wouldn't attract uh, some of the growing businesses and the talented people that we really need here in Minnesota and that we have here. So we need to lower taxes for families and Main Street businesses while we still maintain our quality of life. To do that, we, we prioritize our spending and we limit our waste, our fraud, and abuse that erodes our public trust. So Dan brings up a great point about how we run our state in, the, in, in Minnesota. When they see those in the, in the newspaper, the articles on how much fraud and waste and abuse is going on in the Department of Health and Human Services, that's an embarrassment for us. And there's been audit reports after audit reports that have been done in order to show that these, these problems can be solved and prosecutors can't even prosecute crime when they say these, audit, these accounting systems aren't in place, which can be put in place rather easily to do that. Secondly, uh, business looks for business certainty. Uh, the L3 pipeline. Enbridge is ready to spend $2.4 billion on jobs and, and to, to take care of a pipeline that needs fixing now, and we throw another roadblock. Who wants to do business here when they're not sure mm -hmm. whether we want their $2.4 billion in money and jobs? So those are signals that we're sending that shows that we're not, we don't want you here, we don't, we're not being consistent in how we run things. And finally, what Dan says is true in terms of taxes. It's just constantly finding ways of increasing taxes on the higher levels of our, of our, of our uh, citizens. Why? They can afford to pay more of their fair share. A lot of that is reinvested back here, back into business, because they want to stay here. They want to get more employees. They want to get more uh, equipment. They want to be able to grow here. Give them an opportunity to do that and not put it in the coffers of the state where the money may not be more productive. Well, I agree with uh, some of the earlier comments that have been made that uh, attracting, retaining businesses really begins with a strong community, a strong educational system, strong schools, strong infrastructure to support families, small business opportunities, and jobs. But a little bit different approach. Ernest and Young, the Council on State Taxation and the State Tax Research Institute recently ranked Minnesota's total effective business tax rate for state and local taxes at 4.5%. That's ranking 19th lowest among the states. In 2019, Forbes magazine ranked Minnesota as the best state for business. The misleading piece is that the Minnesota nominal tax rate, which is the written tax rate into law, is high. But Minnesota has several business tax exclusions that reduce the nominal tax rate. Examples include exclusions for capital equipment, manufacturing fuel, and utilities. Minnesota also exempts personal property tax on businesses with high equipment value relative to building value. And we're only one of not eight states that has that tax exemption. I believe we need to continue to invest in our educated workforce and also our Department of Employment Economic Development initiatives. We have many programs in our state to attract businesses, to keep businesses in Minnesota. I'd like to give some examples during my time in office that I've worked on. During my tenure, local businesses have benefited from TIF funding, business expansion grants through DEED, leading to job growth, including Spectro Alloys, SKB Environment, the Abdallah Candies and Upanor expansions in Apple Valley, customized training programs through Dakota County Technical College, and senior citizen housing projects have all benefited our local communities. And most recently, I've been involved in an innovative project through DEED to use treatment 
plant wastewater for industrial cooling as a means to attract business growth. Thank you. I think property taxes are one of the worst taxes uh, we've created, um, whether it's your business or your house, uh, because it doesn't care how much you made that year. It doesn't care if you got sick, um, and it doesn't care if you're on a fixed income. Um, so I think continued property tax reform uh, makes sense to me. Um, and uh, we've, we've done some of that. We stopped the inflator on the commercial industrial tax, uh, property tax, and we also cut that tax by $50 million. And I'm proud we did that because, again, I think it's one of the worst taxes we have. Um, I'll try not to repeat some of what uh, other people have said. I do think uh, a paid leave program and also the option for people to buy into uh, Minnesota Care, they certainly don't have to choose that, um, would be a boon to Minnesota businesses. I think economic growth, however, is a chicken and the egg problem right now in Minnesota, um, and it's related to housing. Uh, certainly businesses attract residents and residents attract businesses. Um, but either way, Minnesota just simply doesn't have enough housing uh, for folks, and that's why you're seeing uh, high prices. Um, so some things I think we need to do, uh, we certainly need to invest in, um, in housing infrastructure bonds, and there are a number of bills to do that at the Capitol. Uh, we also need to have some elected representation on the Met Council so that uh, citizens have an outlet for their frustrations over some of the regulations. But we also need to open up uh, more land for development and not artificially restrict it. Um, and of course, I agree that uh, you know, education is, is one of the primary reasons why businesses locate to Minnesota. We have an educated uh, and amazing workforce. I do want to talk about infrastructure in my last uh, 30 seconds here. Uh, one of the most important things we can do in Minnesota is maintain the infrastructure of small town Minnesota. If you want affordable housing, um, that's the one way to do it. And so I've been proud that we were able to get uh, Denison, Minnesota, a sewer pump for $726,000 in a bonding bill. That'll keep that city going, and we can do that all over uh, Minnesota. Finally, I've been proud to invest in a lot of uh, transit options for uh, Lakeville. We funded the Orange Line. We brought Metro Mobility to the city, um, and I have a bill to expand the Kenrick Avenue Park and Ride. Thank you. We may switch back to uh, the fishbowl here, but for right now, I'm going to uh, ask Mr. Hall to start out with a question from our audience, and I'm going to I'm going to modify it a little bit uh, since this is a forum uh, geared towards uh, businesses. And um, so, my the question from the audience is: is what are your top two or three business centric? And that's my modification. What are your top two or three business centric priorities? should you be elected? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, shooting from the hip, uh, I would say probably we need to uh, reform our education system. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done differently that would improve our system. Uh, we need to quit just pouring money into it. Uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul, if you don't know, gets a lot more per student funding than we do out in Lakeville or Burnsville or Savage, and yet their results are terrible. Uh, around 50% of the kids in uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul do not graduate on time. I didn't say 15, I said 50%. Shame on us that we would uh, not be able to take care of that gap. The other thing with education, of course, is that we've got uh, a lot of different other value um, avenues that kids should be taking, not just going to college. Uh, they can go to trade schools. Um, they can do apprenticeship programs. Those are all good things that they can still make good wages when they get out. So that would be my first. My second would be to hold the line. Uh, I, yes, I would like to be able to help out and supplement uh, some of the loss that businesses have gone through. But realistically, it's going to be hard to do that. It's going to be hard to get uh, both sides of the aisle to work together on that. Uh, I try to do that, try to reach across the aisle. Um, but I think it's important that we not only look at uh, education, not only look at um, uh, the business climate, but we also need to take into account w w a family life. And, uh, and somehow we seem to be losing uh, the family structure and I know I'm running out of time here, uh, but it's important that we build up that value. I am about faith, family, and freedom, and to me it's really important that we have those kinds of values. 
President, I answer that question? Yep, please. Okay. Uh, for one, I, I can repeat it if you'd like. I think I got it. Thank you. Uh, for one, I, I agree with my colleague in terms of offering those choices. Uh, we, do, we do a great job in our schools today in terms of pushing a lot of our young folks to go to college, but there's not enough exposure to the trades, uh, welding, pl plumbers, uh, electricians. They're in dire need today uh, for, for home construction and incorporations today. So that's one. We have to look at that a little more closely. I've thought about it. no cost way of doing that is having our high schools be a little bit more open and working with our businesses to have those folks come in and say, look what you can do in this area, we'll work with uh, DCTC, Metro State, Normandale in order to be able to move those programs through without any cost at all. Uh, the other thing is some of the, these businesses are concerned about liability. Uh, what's gonna happen? I'm trying to open up. What can I do? Can the state kind of help me out in terms of dealing with some of these liability issues? Maybe we can set up a, a temporary uh, uh, in, uh, provision in, 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 in Minnesota for, for funds and limit the liability uh, and, and so that that way business owners can say, I can pay for something like this. And if there is a concern and I'm following these guidelines, I have a little bit of a chance of not getting sued for opening my business and trying to move forward. Back in uh, 2013, when I was first elected, uh, we started the session off with the first Minnesota uh, workshop day. And I remember very clearly there was a presentation by the Minneapolis-St. Paul Economic uh, Council. And they said that the 13 counties surrounding Minneapolis-St. Paul is the 68th largest economy in the world. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And then they went on to say, it's because of our educated workforce. And so that's been a focus that I've had in the Senate. I think one of the things we have to realize that we have to develop our own workshop, our own workforce rather. Uh, for decades, we relied upon North and South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, people coming to Minnesota for jobs. We had a ready-made workforce. That's not happening anymore. We must grow our own workforce. Demographic trends indicate that our future workforce will largely come from immigrant populations. We can't afford to leave them behind when it comes to education. In 2014, as the vice chair of the Higher Education Workforce Development Committee, I was one of the organizers of the North Star Summit. Over 300 businesses and educational leaders met with the expressed goal to identify initiatives to meet the employment needs of Minnesota businesses. The summit resulted in additional internship programs, state tuition assistance for identified workforce areas of underemployment, private initiatives to sponsor students while attending higher education institutions to fill workforce needs and greater analysis of future workforce trends coordinated with higher education programming. And these recommendations included two-year, four-year degree programs as well as licensing and certificate programs. So workforce development through education is what I see as the future. We need to invest in early education and we need to recognize that Education is bigger than just education. It takes a community to raise a child, and we need to recognize that health and human services plays a big role in that process, so thank you. Um, I'll recap some of what we said, and then I'll uh, add two or three additional ones as per the question. Uh, again, I think allowing people to buy into Minnesota Care is a huge help to small businesses in competing and getting employees um, to their business. Um, I think paid family leave will be incredibly attractive to uh, people living in uh, surrounding states to get them to come and work here and live here and, uh, and spend their money here uh, helping other businesses. Uh, lastly, if we still don't have it figured out uh, by uh, November 3rd, we, we do need to create that horizon for uh, businesses in relation to ending um, the, the COVID regulations and closures. Um, so that'll be work we have to do. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to that, I would say the, the first thing we gotta do is we gotta do a bonding bill because all that infrastructure plays into the success of businesses. All those uh, housing bonds play into whether or not there's a workforce available or people have a, a place to, to live nearby where they work. Um, and we also need to uh, continue investment in 
um, things like the Minnesota Investment Fund and the Job Creation Fund, um, which we restored uh, in, in uh, a, a session about three years ago. And, and that's a program that Lakeville has uh, been really successful in using to attract and retain businesses uh, here in Lakeville. But finally, I wanna talk about the trades. We need to get more people in the trades. We've had a messaging problem since I was a kid, since, uh, well, actually since Zach and I were kids, I guess I can say. Um, we've been told we need to uh, you know, go to college and get a degree, that's why he's got an MBA and I, I've got a law degree, because that's what we were told to do. Um, but there are so many other opportunities out there. Um, that's why I'm proud we did the Youth Skills uh, Training Program grants, which Lakeville Works received. I'm proud we have a Helmets to Hard Hat program so uh, veterans can get into the trades. Um, you know, I like to tell the story where my younger brother doesn't have a, a four-year degree, and he makes three times as much as I do, and he will tell you that as often as he can. <laughs> um, and so we've got to stop uh, that messaging problem we have. Thank you. Uh, first off, thanks for the questions. I want to show that uh, we can get along. So I'm right there with Matt in terms of uh, I see a value in a bonding bill. There's no doubt about it. And uh, I, I admit that I'm a terrible handyman. Uh, I didn't get the quality training and trades type stuff that I certainly could have, uh, which is why I turned to my dad most often to help out with things <laughs> like that. Thanks for being here, Dad. Um, to uh, answer the question very simply, uh, top three priorities would be, number one, allow our small businesses to open and operate safely. I think we've, we've touched on that quite a bit. That has to be a priority sooner rather than later. We keep saying it. Uh, business owners, uh, rightfully so, have lost their patience, and they keep saying, okay, great. Well, when are we going to finally get there? When are you going to let me operate, serve my clients, earn a living, and have some confidence and faith in the growth of my business <clears throat> in my ability to keep my people employed? We also have to focus on solutions to manage the deficit in a way that isn't simply raising taxes on our small business owners and families. That's going to compound the significant economic issue that we have. It's going to put everybody in a worse position than they already are. And then we need to allow uh, the local legislators that are supposed to be representing our small business owners to have a voice at the Capitol again. Uh, let the legislators have a conversation and find some consensus about what those metrics should be. What does make sense? How should we reopen? What is that horizon? If they're not having a conversation about it on a continual basis, if they can't collaborate and find a way to agree on it, we're going to continue to get more of what we get at each month, which is a failure to find a solution on how we're going to move forward. I'll give you an example of, of uh, when our local legislators aren't allowed to be able to participate in the process, and it has to do with schools. The state just kind of mandated, here's your process, here's the dials, and they said local control at the school district. Well, that was kind of false advertising because we as a school district had to abide by state regulations that I think had our local legislators been a part of the process, they would have utilized a little common sense and helped us avoid some of the situations we found ourselves in when we're trying to provide quality education options and choices for our families. Thank you. Well, that went well, so let's take another question from the audience. <laughs> uh, given the multi-billion dollar projected deficit uh, next year, what taxes, if any, would you be most comfortable raising to address the deficit? And I believe, Mr. Jimenez, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, flatly, I would not raise taxes. We, as Minnesotans, are overtaxed. We, our, our budget right now is about $48.5 billion for a biennium, and that's expected to go up to $55 billion in about three years. Folks, where's the money coming from, and where is the money going to? We need to start asking those questions, and now that situation has gotten even worse because of the COVID situation and the riots. 50% uh, of uh, revenue for the state comes from state income tax, so we're down on our jobs. 25% of that uh, revenue for the state comes from state income tax, and we're down on our sales. So, but there's opportunity in other departments for cutting, and we have to re we have to ask ourselves: Do we really need program A or program B? When I was in a corporation, I look at those things: Is that really essential for me to run my business? If I'm Apple Corporation, do I put more money in iPods or do I put more money in iPhones? Uh, I look and say: No, my iPhone sales are great. I'm going to move that money or cut out that program. That's what we need to do. Back in 2011, when we had that shutdown, what was interesting is that we were able to run the state with essential services. A lot of people weren't complaining for a couple of weeks. 
and we were saving a lot of money. That taught us a lesson that maybe there's a lot of things that are not essential in running this business. I heard, I talked to an individual who's close to retirement in DHS, and they've told me there's a lot of waste there. There's a lot of opportunity there, and we need to, we need to ask ourselves a question. Let's look at some of those more closely and cut, cut, cut there and other places so that we can try to meet the numbers and not have to tax Minnesotans any further. Thank you. Well, I tend to agree that uh, my first option would not be to raise taxes. I'd look at internal agencies. Uh, I think looking and asking agencies and those workers within those various departments uh, where are some areas that you believe that we can cut? But I think even before that, I think we'd need to do a values review. What's really important to the people of Minnesota? What's important to the people of Lakeville? What essential state services, local services, are really important to people in Minnesota? So I think we'd have to have that values discussion first and find out what the people of Minnesota really have to say about that. And then looking at the various agencies and looking at how they believe they can save money. It's a really difficult, difficult process. As a high school principal, <clears throat> uh, educational budgets tend to go up and down. And when you're faced with having to, to make cuts, it's difficult. And in education, because it's a people-centered business, we always had to look at our employees. And so I don't think that we can look and excuse any area within the state, agencies, various groups, and say we're not gonna touch those, those areas. I think we have to be creative. We have to look at a number of ways on how we can save money, on how we can work to also look at are there some ways that we can actually increase revenue? Are there ways that we can save money and increase revenue and then move ahead? But again, I think this is a values-driven uh, process that we have to go through uh, to really find out what's important to Minnesotans. <clears throat> well, I'll reiterate a couple points uh, once again, uh, which is, uh, we've got to get this economy back moving. Uh, that's going to be uh, the best way to uh, soften uh, the budget deficit. So that's the horizon I've talked about, and it's good that I've uh, got Zach's support on the metric space horizon now. Um, and we also need to pass a bonding bill um, because that is going to create over 20,000 jobs, and that's going to bring uh, revenue across the state. Um, but again, we've got to do the math. Uh, that won't be enough uh, to handle the budget deficit. So we're going to need uh, likely a 5% cut across most departments. Uh, we need to prioritize and protect departments like public safety, uh, vital health care services, and uh, programs for special education <clears throat> and day programs. Um, but that's the simple math. That's what we're going to have to do. Um, I, we're not going to tax our way out of it. That's not, that's not what we're going to do. Um, there's got to be cuts. And then, uh, like Senator Clausen said, we've got to look at uh, different revenue sources. I'm a big uh, proponent of uh, sports gambling. I think we should uh, legalize that in our state, and so we're not losing the, the revenue to Iowa. Um, you know, I, for one, I, I don't think I'm going to place a bet on the Vikings to win the Super Bowl, but I just might. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've got to look at those things um, <clears throat> if we're going to get ourselves out of this budget deficit. Uh, so I think the question was, which taxes would you support raising? Okay, so I think that's a, a pretty easy answer. It's almost like a trick question, I think. Uh, the answer is absolutely none. I'm not supportive of raising taxes, especially in the environment in which we find ourselves in. A lot of people are struggling to make ends meet. Some have been laid off. Uh, businesses are honestly, they're just trying to break even every month. I should say every week or probably every day. Uh, the last thing they need is an increase to their taxes when honestly they're just trying to make enough to keep the business open, 
pay their employees, and put food on the table for their families. So I, I'm not in favor of looking at raising taxes anytime in the near future whatsoever. I'd go back to the answer I gave earlier, which was as a business owner, as, a, as you manage your household, you have to look at wasteful spending and you have to look at where you can cut and sometimes both. I think you've heard a lot of general consensus on the fact that that needs to be looked at across the board at a state level. Uh, and so I think that's an easy, an easy thing, hopefully, for folks to collaborate on moving forward. So I'll just give you my perspective as a business owner because I think when sometimes uh, the general public hears businesses talk about taxes, they don't, they don't quite understand why, what, what paying those additional taxes actually means for the business. Uh, higher taxes equals less money to invest in more employees. It means less money for pay raises, less money for benefits, less money for growth, less money to pursue other opportunities that the business can realize, which would in turn uh, bring more jobs to local communities, uh, as well as uh, all the other ways in which our businesses invest in and support our communities. So don't misunderstand me by saying I, I'm, I'm all about the money because that is not the case. I'm all about our community finding a way forward in partnership with business, in partnership with schools, in partnership with families, and the more uh, additional resources those businesses have to continue to invest in themselves and our community, the, the faster we're going to be able to find our ways out of uh, the deficit in the situation we find ourselves in currently. Thank you. Well, I know I'm just saying it again, uh, but Zach, I, I agree with you. Um, I think it's well stated. Uh, cutting taxes um, is what we need to do and increase. It will increase taxable income. What we could do is cut the fat out of government and uh, deregulate some of the uh, business regulations that are out there. Uh, I also appreciate um, uh, Senator Little's uh, discussion on the bonding bill. We really do need a bonding bill. It'd be really important. We actually uh, have voted on a bonding bill uh, in the Senate. Uh, it was a bipartisan vote, though I, at that point, Matt, you voted against it. Um, it's, it's important that we um, get our infrastructure paid for. And every year that seems to be a political football, and I'm really tired of it. Um, but the 21st, we're going to have another, another opportunity, I hope, to pass that. See how nicely you get along when we get questions from the, from the audience? It's fantastic. <laughs> no, I appreciate uh, all of your candor tonight. You've uh, been a, a, a great uh, set of candidates, and you've provided some, some quality and, and thoughtful answers. I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, at this point in the evening, uh, we're ready for our closing remarks, and I believe, Mr. Clausen, you're up. Well, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve the communities of Apple Valley, Rosemont, Northeast Lakeville, and Coates in the Senate. And I've worked hard to earn the public support and trust and will continue to work hard to make a difference in the lives of Minnesotans and the future of our communities. Uh, people often ask, what are your legislative accomplishments of which you are most proud? My immediate response is my ability to work across the aisle to get things done. Over 75% of the bills I have authored have bipartisan support. I've worked hard to develop relationships as the first step to work above partisan politics. And it begins with my personal perspective that I am not a politician, but rather a public servant. <clears throat> I'm a founding member of the Purple Caucus in the Senate. It's Democrat and Republican members coming together to find common ground on issues and to support one another. We're not always successful on all issues, but over 75%, as I mentioned, of my bills are bipartisan. I'd like to end by thanking our heroes through these difficult and stressful days. Our medical workers, first responders, teachers, food service workers, truck drivers, military personnel, mail carriers, farmers, utility workers, volunteers, and a special thanks to our law enforcement officers who are to protect and serve during these difficult days. Working together, we can build Minnesota's future. If you would like additional information on my candidacy, please visit my website, which is ClawsonForSenate.com. Thank you. 
Well, I knew Senator Hall was going to get a shot in at me uh, at some point in this debate, but let me explain that vote, which is I voted against that bill because it didn't have enough money for our district. It only gave about $200,000 to Lakeville, but I also represent uh, uh, Farmington and Southern Dakota County, and I was fighting for Randolph, Minnesota, who needs uh, a wastewater sewage system, and because I voted no, I was able to get $13 million in the House bill, which did pass. Um, you know, Zach said that uh, he doesn't think uh, he supports any uh, tax increases, but he is currently scheduling and planning a, a levy campaign um, for later this year or next year. Um, so that's just simply not true. Uh, but I want to return to something I said at the, the beginning of this, um, and it's related to the clean campaign contract. Um, the way we campaign is a reflection of how we're governed, and that's why I've committed to a positive campaign with the three points I've talked about. A week ago, we asked Zach if he would commit to those three principles, and so far, he's refused to do so. So I, I hope in his speech, um, he commits those principles tonight, um, because this district deserves a ton better. Now, I'm going to tell you why you should vote for me, and it's a little weird because I'm not even going to tell you to vote for me because of the issues or positions I've taken. I'm telling you to vote for me because you know where I stand. I tell you where I stand. I give you my positions, and if you don't like them, you can find me, you can talk to me, you can argue with me, you can even yell at me, and maybe I'll yell back because that's kind of the guy I am, but we're going to talk that through, and we're going to figure that conversation out because we need to heal the divide of this nation. Uh, 2020 has certainly been uh, a trying year thus far for all of us, our state and our country. Our healthcare system and frontline workers faced unprecedented challenges. Schools were interrupted. Businesses were forced to close. Jobs were lost and the economy suffered. A light was shined on racial injustice and many have lost loved ones. The only thing I know to do in times of crisis is to raise my hand and step forward to serve, to offer calm and reasoned leadership, leadership of substance that fosters collaboration, focuses on solutions, and remembers that the people of our district and state come before party politics. We can't afford to be divided. I've stayed focused on the issues and helping those in need, and that's what I'll continue to do at the state capitol. Despite the negativity, anxiousness, and uncertainty that you may feel, I believe in the historical example that generations have set before us. Through their actions and determination, we have emerged stronger after tragedy many times in our nation's history, and we will do it again. We must partner on ways in which we can succeed rather than being lured into a state of hatred or divisiveness. It's in our nature to unite when faced with the challenge. Let's rise to the occasion together. I'm Zach Duckworth, and I would be honored to earn your vote for State Senate. Thank you. So I want to thank the Lakeville Chamber, um, our hosts, um, and I want to thank my constituents for giving me the trust for the last 10 years. It's been a wonderful time. Uh, probably the hardest thing I've done in my life, though. So two thoughts I want to leave with you as you contemplate your vote. First, the 2021 budget will be close to the largest deficit in the history of Minnesota. So your question today is, who do you want to balance that budget? Budget. Do you want Democrats that are known for raising taxes and increasing spending? Or do you want Republicans who are known for tightening their belt and cutting taxes as we did in 2011 when we were in the majority and had to adjust the $5 billion deficit then. Second thought, we are living in a violent world. Today we need experienced legislators who can listen, make wise decisions, and keep Minnesotans safe. Safety is my number one priority. We cannot have safety without having uh, law and order. So I promise you, as I've been endorsed by the Police Officers Association, to protect the public and uphold law and order. And by the way, Zach, you don't have to sign a promise to play fair because that's the kind of guy you are, and I appreciate that. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you all for being with us tonight and bear with us. Well, our colleagues, are, we have a great group of colleagues. You have a good and tough choice ahead of you. 
but thank you all for being here tonight. I'm truly, as I said, but we're blessed to be here and grateful to be living in the, the greatest country in the world. As a lawyer, when we come into a situation, we, we're taught the sort of the art of working with folks for compromise. And they, we define compromise as not each side gets everything they want, but at the end, they get what they really need. And I'm hoping to bring to bear that experience of bringing people together and trying to figure out what is it that we can, we can live with so that we can move on, especially in these uh, uh, partisan times. I have a good friend in Chicago who's, uh, I am Republican, conservative, he's a Democrat, we've been good friends since college, and he sent me a really kind note and a, and a big donation, and it was a problem with him and his wife, actually. He said, I'm sending this to Jose because of the kind of person that he is. I love him and I trust him. And that's what I hope to bring to St. Paul. Yes, just like my, my opponent, I'm a likable person, but I believe that I have the better vision for our district, and I hope that I can bring the creativity and drive to do those things differently than in the past. I hope I've earned your vote to be your next senator, and God bless to all of you, and thank you all for your time this evening. Gentlemen, on behalf of the business and residents of Lakeville and the Lakeville Area Chamber of Commerce, I thank each of you for your passion to serve and for participating in tonight's candidate forum. It was, uh, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope our audience uh, here and at home uh, watching live and those folks that might watch it uh, um, on video uh, enjoy it as well. It was, uh, I thought, very informative and uh, you met the deadline. I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Um, I would also like to thank the City of Lakeville and its staff for the use of this facility and recording tonight's event. All forums will be rebroad excuse me, will be rebroadcast on LGTV channel 180 on Charter and on channel 187 mm -hmm. on Frontier. And it will also be available online at lakevillemn.gov under the Media Center tab. You may also contact the Chamber of Commerce at 952 469-2020 for the link. As always, the Lakeville Chamber of Commerce has not and will not endorse any candidate in any election this year. Good night, and please remember to vote on November 3rd. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.